our first speaker. Now this is this is fantastic. I, 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 we've all made a new friend, and this friend is Lieutenant Colonel John Shaw. Where is he? Oh, he's sitting in the very back of the room. Uh, I got an email from John. I don't know. Maybe it's been a couple months ago, and and I I, I should have probably printed it off, but it was it was a wonderful email. Basically, he said he was a member of our 912 group and that he was overseas and that uh, he appreciated everything that you do and uh, that he was on assignment and that he was from St. Pete and that our emails and our information coming out of our group was really uh, keeping him in touch with back home in St. Pete. And so then not too long ago, maybe a couple of weeks ago, I sent him back an email and said, you know, gee, this is amazing that, you know, you're in Lebanon and, and, and that you're uh, following our, our group and a member of our group. And uh, so a couple of weeks ago, I got another, and I said, you know, let me know when you're going to be in the area. And he emailed a couple of weeks ago and said that he was back in St. Pete and we met. And I was so amazed at his uh, um, information and at his background. Uh, John is a uh, foreign area specialist, I believe, or... Uh, Used to be, yes. Okay. And uh, retired from the Army and on uh, consulting contracts now. And, and, and has special, I mean, he's, you know, and besides besides all of this this uh, expertise in the Mideast, he's also, in my opinion, a historian. Uh, and and uh, he transfixed me. Uh, just in listening to his information. So, without further ado, I'm going to bring up Lieutenant Colonel John Shaw. Thank you. Now, to understand where all of this is coming from and why it, it is what it is and where's it going to go to. And what's going on in the Arab world right now, believe me, is not just restricted to the Arab world. You are going to see the same game play out in a number of other areas for exactly the same reasons. So we need to understand it. Is this? It's on. Oh, I got okay. check. Hold on. Next slide. No, it's, no I got to turn it on. See whether this thing will work. Well, I got to turn it on, John. I okay. turned it off. Turn it on. Islam, and, and I don't know how many people here have studied Islam. Okay. Um, Muhammad, the prophet. Uh, died around 632. So he established monotheism, one, there is one God, among the Bedouin Arab tribes. That's where Islam comes from. And if you take a look at it, it is a, a mixture of some Christian principles, some Hebrew principles, etc. That's where it's coming from. These are the Muslim nations that have majority Muslim populations in the world today. And I want you to remember all of this. So if you think you're going to discount the influence of Islam in the world, you need to take a look at that map and see how much ground. And that's just the Muslim majority countries, not all the countries with Muslim populations. But I want you to sort of remember the size of this area because it will become important later on. I don't know if you can read this. If you know yourself but not the enemy, for every victory you gain, you will also suffer a defeat. That is one of our biggest problems. Most of us do not understand what we are dealing with and consequently what we think is a winning strategy ends up being a losing strategy. Where have we been? Mohammed, the, the inception of Islam. We're going to go through these relatively quickly because I'm not trying to give you a long history lecture, but I want you to understand this because once you understand it, then we can relate it to what's going on now and what radical Islam is trying to do. Rise of Islam, the caliphates, Golden Age, dynasties in the Ottoman Empire, Muslim Brotherhood, and the Arab-Israeli Wars. All of this has an impact on what's going on today. Down here, during Muhammad's lifetime, that was the spread of Islam. 
in successive periods, you see how it expanded up through 750 AD. Later on, it crossed over and took over most of the Balkans, all the way up to the outskirts of Vienna at its maximum range, and, as you can see, most of Spain. This becomes important later on. You've heard the term caliphate. The Islamic radicals want to re-establish the Islamic caliphate. Understand? Okay. The Golden Age. Between 750 and 1258 AD was the golden age of Islam. While our ancestors in Europe were burning each other at the stake for heresy and doing all kinds of other idiot things, and mostly were illiterate peasants, in the Arab world, the knowledge that had been gained through history was being preserved, being taught, and being expanded on. During this age, if you really wanted to live in a civilized society, Western Europe was not a good choice. The Arab world was a good choice. They had the libraries, they were open thinkers, open to new ideas. In fact, during this period, they collected all of the known knowledge, not just from Europe, and from the Middle East, but from Asia. They translated it into Arabic, and literally attempted to accumulate all known knowledge on all subjects, math, science, everything. Mm -hmm. The Ottoman Turkish Empire takes over at the end of the Golden Age. Now, I want you to see, remember that earlier slide that showed you Islam. Now take a look at how much has been cut off from what was there before. By the late 1800s, the decline of Islam had occurred. This is key for us to understand. Between 1200 and 58, 1300, when the Ottoman and Turkish Empire came into existence, at 1800, Western Europe came out of the Middle Ages the Renaissance occurred, and you have the rebirth of knowledge and science in Europe. And as Europe rises, Islam falls. <coughs> Almost in direct proportion. Why? Why? Because they became more corruption, the caliphates, the, again, typical 500 years of the same government, the yeah. same kind of rulers, just like the Roman Empire didn't so much fall because barbarians were invaded, it fell because it became too corrupt, because everything sort of, everything that had been Roman that made Rome ended up disappearing. Well, the same thing happened in the Caliphates. Okay? Then the Roman, and then the Ottoman Turkish Empire came in, and then the same thing happened again there. The Ottomans basically controlled most of the Balkans and the, and this part of the world for about 500 years. If you talk to my wife, she'll tell you it was the 500-year the yoke of Turkish occupation. But I want you to see this and see the, the size, how it shrank by the 1880s. Okay, because we get important. The Muslim Brotherhood, founded in 1928. Albana called for the return to an original Islam and followed Islamic reformers like Abdullah and Rita. These two guys uh, lived in the mid to 1800s to the early 1900s. They were uh, jurists, they were writers, they were very much involved, and they basically outlined what I've just said. Islam has started to fall. It has descended. It has been overshadowed by the West and by Western culture. And they preached a return to the basics of Islam because in their mind that's how Islam would regain its previous 
status. The Muslim Brotherhood is founded in 1928. Now, I want you to think about this. How many people here have seen the old movie uh, Lawrence of Arabia? Everybody, it's some real old. Real old, okay? Well, that's World War I. There's the British operating out of Egypt in World War I. The Ottoman Turkish Empire allied itself with Germany and Austria-Hungary in World War I. The British enlisted the aid through Lawrence of the Bedouin tribes in the Middle East to fight against the Turks. The operators guerrilla forces destroyed Turkish supply lines to make it easier for the British Army to advance in that theater. They promised the Arabs would have a homeland. They won. Okay? That's 1916-1917. During that same time, the British and the French made a secret agreement that was not published until after World War I was over. It's called the Beaufort Agreement. And the Beaufort Agreement divided up the Middle East in post-World War I world. France, who did not have troops in the Middle East at the time, because they were busy in France, got what is now Lebanon and Syria. The rest of it went to Britain in the post-war Beaufort Agreement. World War, II, World War I ends, the Ottoman Turkish Empire is defeated, and subsequently collapses within about four years after the end of World War I. But you don't have an Ottoman Turkish Empire anymore. Now you have a breakup of all of these areas. Britain has Palestine as a United or a League of Nations protectorate. It establishes Saudi Arabia. Okay. However, the Bedouin tribes that the British had worked with basically came out of the Sinai and the Jordan area, close to the British headquarters in Cairo. When they founded Saudi Arabia and installed a king, he was a Hashemite, which is not the Bedouin tribes that live in Saudi Arabia. It's a tribe coming out of Jordan. So in order to get the people, the Bedouin tribe that live in what is now Saudi Arabia, to accept a Hashemite as their leader, the Hashemites had to make an agreement with the Wahhabis, who were a local area and a very fundamentalist group of Islamists. That is why even to this day, you have a very tight tie, you have very conservative religious views by the Saudi government because they made this agreement to stay in power. So understand those connections. What, what Bana said is Islam had lost its social dominance because most Muslims had been corrupted by Western influences. The real important part here is that the bait that